Right, here we are. Welcome to the first ever dog cast. Um, <laughs> we should, we should, <laughs> no, you're giving it away, he's on. Uh, we, should, we should have had, obviously, we should have had Conrad Earl on as our first guest, uh, but he's, he's got his head stuck in a tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, so we've had to make do with a less hurrier guest in the uh, current head coach of the Leeds Rhinos, Richard Ager. How are we doing, pal? Good. I don't know if it's a good thing being on before or after Conrad, mate. I reckon it's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah, be- better week conversion, mate. Let's just say it'd that. Be a, be a, yeah, it'd be way more funnier than me. Uh, I don't know about that, mate. I don't know. So, are, are you dealing with the social he- isolation that's going on at the moment? How, how's that been treating you? Yeah, in different ways. Trying to trying to be productive, if you like. So, uh, I said to you yesterday, went out walking my dog that I ain't got anymore. Uh, I'm doing a bit of walking. We've done the old panic buying. Uh, get us. Uh, get us food in for the next four weeks, whatever it is. And yeah, well, you I'll, told I'll, me your missus has been going berserk, have not you? Yeah, 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 yeah. She panic stations, mate. Panic stations. So yesterday, you know, trying to organise food, what has a bit of a shelf life. She come in with like four big blocks of aluminum cheese. Bite once in but I says, "What? What's this all about?" You know. Oh well, dates on it. It's long, like long. <laughs> so Mate, I'm sat there eating cheese. I've come back to Wigan, obviously today. I'm at my dad's, and uh, everyone's buying bog roll and and chicken and pasta and all that. I've got it, Gary. There's eight crates of pastas. I swear to God. Uh, so obviously, it likes a can in the house, so Dad. Uh, yeah, every, the world's going mad. Uh, the it's world's going mad. It's- is what it is. We just got to get through it. And why don't you uh, run us over the story of uh, of the dog that you've been walking that you've not got anymore? So I went on. I've, I've been on a couple of my old dog walks where I used to take my little French bulldog. Um, but yeah, I ain't got a dog anymore. So um, when I moved to Australia, I had a little French bulldog. But obviously, we thought we were going for two or three years, uh, and the cost of getting him, the cost of getting him out there were enormous we couldn't find a, a good place to rent uh having a dog so we decided that that we couldn't take him so we gave him to joe westerman oh in safe hands well he loves to walk does that dog so i don't know if we were sort of giving him to the right person to walk him there but i know his dad his dad takes care of him well yeah um, probably walked to pull him back that's about it yeah so we give it joe and um funny enough when we come home he said do you want him back uh, so we'd already done goodbyes, you know, heartbroken, giving dog away. And Joe's got three kids, so we said, nah, you're all right. But I just thought he were an easy get out for Joe. He, Why don't you tell us about his name? Dog's, name. Dog's, dog's Elwa, a little French bulldog. Elwa after Elwa. <laughs> so I, no. I let kids, when I coached France, I came to France a few times. And as we all probably know, Elwa's got a, his family's got a, a restaurant on Cane Beach. Um, and they fell in love with Elwa. They love Elwa. So, in uh, in tribute to Elwa, we named his French bulldog after him. Uh, but French bulldogs aren't from France, are they? I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I didn't know I've never first. originated in France now. They're from like Nottingham or something like that. So, <laughs> well, mate, Tommy Lannan's getting an Hungarian French bulldog. So, it's got it. You get it on cheap. Obviously, they must t- uh, transport them over and they have no passport and that. So, they sell them on cheap. So, you know what Tommy's like. He ended up with a with an Hungarian French bulldog. He, he's got, uh, and if we said anything but like a French bulldog as that'd well. Right, Tommy, that'd be right. Yeah. For Tommy. Right, so um, obviously the self isolation and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Let's talk about. Obviously, you're a bit of a, a rugby nerd, and you love your rugby, and you you get quite a bit in into your life. So all the yeah. stresses of being an head coach. What do you do when you're away from rugby league? What do you like to to be doing then? Uh... Yeah, well, I spend a lot of time on rugby, as you know. So, um, you know, during during the season, it, it sort of fairly consumes consumes and dominates your life, really. So, you know, we all three grades to watch, doing a lot of video training. So, outside of that, mate, just usual things. Go out for a meal every now and then. I like to get down down to my local for a beer. Yeah. Catch up with my mates when I can. Uh Take myself away on holiday. Like I could try and get to Australia when I can to catch up with people and watch some more rugby. Um, yeah. So all pretty, yeah, all pretty normal stuff, mate. It's not nothing too exotic going you've, on. You've um, you've missed out the reading. I thought you did quite a bit of reading. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had this. Yeah, when we when we prepped for his phone call. So yeah, I like to read. I read yeah. uh, I'm an, an avid reader, if you like. And um, well, you clock them books in your background. Yeah. So I've got, I have my books by my bed, different ones. Uh, do you want me to show you them? One yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have a run through what, what you're reading at the moment. I'm gonna flip you around. Then. I'm gonna flip you around. Yeah, here we go. So, a minute. They've got my glasses there, dog, too. I've, I've never seen me with them on, have you? Yeah, I'm not. Why do they never come into training? Hey. Because I don't I don't read books at work, mate, and have my laptop in bed on a night. So there's a couple. That's a good book, Secret Race. We've, we must have a green light on that. You must try them glasses on. Let's have a look. You must I'll, look like that. I'll, I'll, put them on <laughs> I'll put them on in a set. I'll put them on in a Paul Caddick, give me this one to read. Bounce, which is about talent. And American football. Can you remember him, Alistair Campbell? Came into Warrington. We had this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was um, that had lost my memory. I'd forgot about that, but now you've reminded me. I remember who he yeah, was. Yeah, he famous politician came into Warrington and spoke to us all. So I went out and bought his book, uh, David Cameron's couple of NFL books. So yeah, these are my glasses. And let me flick you back round. Are we back? Are we back round? Right. Hang on. One and time. I'm never ever putting these on again. Oh, yeah. yeah, no one will see it. It's only me and you. Bed on and I, look, look at them. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I tell you what, if this podcast is, oh, I'm not bothered. I've seen you with your glasses on. <laughs> yeah. I'm made up with that. I'm made up. Yeah, so a bit of reading, a bit of reading. All right, what should we go on to next? A bit of a reader. Um, What was I going to say then? Oh, one of, one of the questions I was going to ask, how did you get from... Um, being a player, obviously you, you played a, a, quite a long career. How did you end up then transitioning into coaching? How did you, how did that come about? Yeah, pro- probably something I wanted to do for a long time, really, because obviously my dad was a player and a coach, so I'm very, very lucky in that um, through my childhood, if you like, while my dad was playing, uh, different in them days, you know, players were part time, so we used to go along to watch. You know, spend the bulk of my childhood watching OKR, really. Um, we had five or six years there, yeah. And um, they had a really good team at time, won championship a couple of times, and uh, won challenge cup, won most domestic comps, really. Um, so as a young kid, I mean, a really young kid, you know, five, six, seven, eight year old, I spent a lot of time in changing rooms, and when the games were finished, we'd, we'd jump on the off field at Craven Park and kick goals use sand off the dog track to, to make his little mounds and kick goals of her. Uh, so I spent a lot of time around rugby rugby players, uh, changing rooms. Back then they had the old video to video, no computers back then. So we used to edit your videos using two, uh, two cassette recorders. And so Sunday nights, you know, straight on from the game stick the video in and I might sit and do the stats for the game or, or watch what he was cutting up and um, you know, before mobile phones too, so all the, you know, you used to, you used to have your phone in your hallway when you were a kid. Uh, yeah, we did. And connect are you, connect are you internet as well. Are you that young? Um, yeah, we still had a, we, we, my nan and that, my nan still had um, a landline. She had a, yeah, still had a landline. Old landline in the hallway, so when he was doing his rugby calls on a night, he used to, instead of being in bed, he used to lean over at Bannister and listen to listen to all bad news that were coming his way. <laughs> he were, he generally he worked for Featherstone a fair bit, so it, you know, they were a selling club, so usually disappointment when they were skint and they had to sell the best players on and stuff like that. But yeah, he used to get the gist of the conversation. So yeah, we're all I were always sort of um engrossed in it if you like as a as a young bloke coming through. So right right at the end of my playing at my playing days when we're playing at Witness. Um by accident, I sort of ended up coaching England students and coached my local team in conference, Featherstone Lions. You know, the old Traveller Saints turned into Featherstone Lions, and I, I coached, coached my mates really for a couple of years at, at that level. And so it was a fairly, fairly natural progression for me, really. We've worked together before in the past, obviously, at Warrington. And, and let's talk about the drop goal last year. And, and you don't just come <laughs> to Leeds, yeah, you don't just come to Leeds in a, in a different capacity. I think you was. Um, nothing to do with the coaching really at that time, but you still got to mention after the drop goal. Do you want to explain that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll gladly explain that one because, yeah, again, you managed to get me a load of stick over that. Your people, oh, he stopped from doing drop goals. <laughs> 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 you can't believe it. So, 
Right, this, this, there's a lot, there's a long story to this is that when I was coach of all, I had a player knock another player out day before a game on a drop goal. So everybody, everybody at the end of training likes to kick goals or knock some drop goals over, fancies himself as a kicker. So they won't mind me saying that. Will Sharp hit Jordan Turner point blank from less than 10 metres, you know, smashed him in the face with a drop goal and Jordan knocked him out. You know, gone yeah. before it hit the floor. So Jordan's on a bus trip, you know, ready to travel, knocked out. He wouldn't have been able to play today's, you know, concussion protocols. So we banned people, not practicing drop goals, but if you wanted to practice them, you had to practice them you know, road. away from everybody and do it in a in a proper practice. So when it got to Warrington, you were spraying them about <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. And so this, we used to go out game day and all disabled people used to sit at back at post and I'm risk assessing thinking he's just going to take someone out one day uh, so yeah I used to make you practice away from people or, or just stop you spraying it into crowds again. yeah messing about they I, did, I did want it crowd. yes I think I want yeah. to know I know where you're coming from and you have got a valid point yeah. mate. I, I that's, get that's why you got rid of you <laughs> <laughs> that was hey we both we, we both got the act so it, it was my fault um, so yeah, yeah I, I caught yes I had head once and it stayed behind all, all players. I thought, hopefully I get away from this. But he, he just laughed at it to be fair. Um, but yeah, I had to give you a shout, shout out on that one. Yeah, um, give me a shout out. But all, all you did was manage to get me some more abuse for stopping you. What sort of a coach would stop him taking drop goals? Well, that's not quite. That's not quite they, <laughs> they won't stop me from taking drop goals. It looked like a bag of cement when I kicked. Um, right, do you want to... I'm, we glad we brought to it I'm, glad, I'm glad we brought it up anyway. <laughs> there, it's still a time it's ever going to happen. That's coming out there, mate. So it has to, You've it has to ring be it dry, there. pal. You've got to ring it dry. Yeah, let's um, talk about the spirit of the Rhino that we've got at Leeds Rhinos. And um, there was a clip on Sky Sports that explained it, so we can obviously talk about it now. Um, like we don't need to speak about anything that we put in because obviously that's private for us and the boys, boys to know. But just uh, give us a gist of what the spirit of the Rhino is and, and what it means to us as a, as a group. Um, it's a fairly, fairly long story in its origins, really. Um, uh, but, yeah, it wasn't meant to be secret and just for us, really. Uh, but it, I think very early doors, it, it got to run out in uh, in the corporate at Leeds. And because of, because of the proximity of where it actually is, it gets talked about a fair bit, yeah. so I, I guess it's only natural that you know the 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 sort of story behind it came out a little bit. But it, it was around it was around going moving into new changing rooms and probably around uh, a little bit where we were as a group at, at times last year. Um, that you know when when we were having it, you know when we were having some tough times, we felt we all needed to pull together a little bit, and you know it's fair to say. Um, yeah, probably weren't the most harmonious group and a little bit fractious in in certain ways at times. Uh, but we asked you guys, you know, we sat in, in the meeting rooms that we were, didn't we? And we asked you guys what you want, you know, what you expected from your camp, what you felt were acceptable standards, um, you know, what we uh, what we demanded from each other, how we'd hold each other accountable, you know, all that sort of stuff. And had some, you know, some fairly honest meetings where. You know, did you start to? It had to be more than words on a wall for us. We had to sort of li live those behaviours, if you like. Um, and it was just moving into the new changing room. I think we went to Magic Weekend at Anfield, and somebody threw up that you know we should have you know this is Anfield, the famous this is Anfield sign. We should get one saying this is Edinley. But you know we were going through that period exactly at, at that time, and you know I just thought we could maybe expand on it a little bit more. So I spoke to Jonesy, and Jonesy's. A good ideas man and, and sometimes a, a, a wacky ideas man so we we talked about something we we could all have um that meant something to us uh meant something to each other but something that were very personal to you as well um you know i didn't have in my mind such a big uh i would say monstrosity but it's not a, a big work of art like jonesy produced yeah, yeah. It's a bit about <laughs> <laughs> you won't be happy with that, mate. Well, no, no, it's, it's brilliant. The what yeah. he come up with, you know, my idea really was, was like a, 
sort of a, something on a plinth, you know, like a rhino yeah, yeah. on a plinth that we could carry around with us. That's and when he got out at first, I was like, my word, where's he found that from? <laughs> uh, but the idea of putting it on the wall as a permanent reminder and, and you know, just exactly where it's placed, yeah. and it can be sort of, you know, the, the ashes can be used year on year on year. So, you know, whoever comes in after us, if they want to buy into that, that could be there for 25, 30 years. And I just love the idea that, you know, when you walk down the tunnel and, you know, you've got your very own private, um, you know, private reasons and what you committed and why, and, and we know what they are, uh, yeah. that the last thing you do before you walk onto that field is, you know, you have that little bit of inspiration as you're walking out. So, um, you know, the way it worked out, you know, I thought were really good. I thought Jonesy kicked it off great last year. Yeah. Uh, in in actually what he committed, you know, he committed something that would have been very valuable, precious, sentimental to him, and as we know, he's a great orator too. So, yeah, you know, his speech to get it going were terrific, and um, it was a little bit unknown last year. So we had varying degrees yeah. of what guys were committing. You know, you can maybe talk about that a little bit, but I thought this year, you know, I thought it were unbelievable, really incredible this year. What you know, what the boys. Uh, committed the emotion that we got out, uh, the barriers that it broke down. You know, I think you get to you get to learn a little bit more about each other. Um, you get to know some really private and personal stuff, uh, and I think it helps camaraderie. I think it helps respect amongst each other. Um, I think you know individuals being able to open up like that to the teammates. Yeah, uh, you know, is a good thing for a for a group as well. So, um, yeah, you know, certainly. It's certainly something that means a lot to us, even if it might seem gimmicky to, yeah. you know, to outsiders looking in. I think we know internally, um, you know, we hold some things inside our group very valuable, and you know, it's been uh, it's been really productive for us. Yeah, I think um, one one moment that, that sticks out with me with that. Um, obviously, it was it was a, a month or so, a bit longer into you taking the. Well, the temporary head, head coach job at Leeds, yeah. and, and obviously you got on with with Hermsy as well, so it was difficult for you in in in, in that moment. Um, and your first talk about it was I'm just taking over and helping out, and you had no no um, ambition for the job really uh, when, when you first took it. And then I remember that being probably the moment that we did this spirit of the rhino, and was all stood around the fire, and was all committing things into the fire that were going to be made into this ash. Uh, and then the resin that's going to be on the rhino. So then we're all committing something to this thing. And I remember just that being you saying, I can't ask you guys to commit to this and then not do it myself. So this is my commitment. And I just remember that being the first bit of commitment from you and, and pro a real big moment, really, that, that probably started bringing us all together as a group. And like, like you say, at first it was a bit like people didn't know how to take it and what was going to happen. Uh, and so people were putting all playing socks in that had come from a team that they'd played for or yeah. some some symbol of where their journey had been with rugby um, but then I think this year it just went more personal it just went away from rugby and it just went these are my reasons why I'm playing rugby for my family for, for, for di um, these sort of experiences that we've been together and, and people are putting really deep things in uh, and just I think it shows how good we are as a group at the moment that how people took that uh, and yeah. it's a symbol of where we are as a group. I think it's a good thing that there's no fear of, you know, opening up and feeling like you're going to be ridiculed or, or laughed at from the group. I think what you found is people were opening up. There's plenty of tears. I thought some of the stories were amazing, you know. Yeah. Without yeah. too much. So I, I listened to Moise Mustafa's story and it's just yeah. an incredible... Yeah incredible story uh, yeah. uh, where, how he is where he is and yeah. you know what he puts into it and stuff like that and I just I just think it's great that you can speak like that without fear of as I say anything coming back from your mates but yeah. just being so open and honest and I, and I think when you need them moments on the field yeah, um, right. you sort of you know it sort of transmits into that too well, uh, that's what I was thinking then it's not just you're not a group of, of 20 odd men who's there to do a job, you actually, that spirit of the run or what that does, it gives you the environment and the platform to open up in front of each other and get to know each other. And then through that, you start caring for each other. Now, then when you're playing together on a field, you're not just playing with some bloke, you actually care for each other and want to, to, to work for each other. So that's the 
that's how the the personal side of it can then re- actually not being mental, but that can actually affect our performances as a, as a group, really. Yeah, and it can hold you up in tough times too. You know, it's not all going to be perfect. We all know that. But yeah. I say being being accountable to each other, but in the right ways, and being able to yeah. give and receive that feedback, and you know, have them tough conversations is what what's vital to a group. And you know, we spend a lot of time watching opposition. We spend a lot of time practicing as catch and as pass and as tackle technique. But sometimes, you know, I just think you have to practice. Uh, working on yourselves and your culture a little bit too. You know, culture is a heavily used word in sport these days, but, uh, you know, we spend time, I would say, we spend a fair bit of time trying to reward it, you know, reward good culture, Uh, but also, you know, identifying it, talking about it, working on it, and, uh, you know, hopefully we've seen the rewards. So, a topic that me and you probably will will be all right, why we've got you on the phone and give people an insight into... What goes on with a player and coach? I think this is probably a perfect opportunity. You're pretty open, and, and I'm pretty open. Um, so let's talk about the conversation that we had in in off season last year. Um, obviously, from my point of view, I'd probably had playing wise and, and minutes wise, but the best year that I'd had um, yeah. in my career. Um, and obviously, there was probably only me at nine at the moment, and we didn't know whether he was going to bring in. The, to the club or not so he was having these conversations and and we had a pretty tough uh conversation in, in off season because obviously i thought i was on this high and 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 was had a certain opinion of my performance and you obviously didn't agree so i want to give you a version of it i love the way that you articulated that i had a real I had a real good opinion about my performance um it, it, yeah if you look we'll, we'll talk about it and uh yeah, just one a difficult conversation for us, really. You know, we, we've, you know, I felt last year that, um, look, I, you know, we worked together before, so I know all your strengths and good points. You know, the, the competitive nature of uh, how you operate day in day out. You know, when when we're doing stuff at training, uh, you, you're exactly as you are in a game, real competitive uh, and tenacious and brave. Uh, you know, all the stuff you can bring to a team on your kick pressures and what we, when you bend your back in D and, um, you know, what you bring with your running game and all that. But Don't worry, really wait for it. It's coming. There's a ball. Yeah, well, There's I've, a got, ball. I've, got to, I've got to sort of build it up before I... <laughs> before <laughs> I blow my legs, legs off here. Uh, <laughs> but I, fe- I felt that, you know, you'd got an erratic, uh, you know, you got some erratic parts to your game and erratic parts to your personality. So some of them erratic parts of, of what bring some, you know, some of them qualities, but I felt, you know, the balance were out of kilter. Yeah. So, you know, for the people, people that act, will anybody watch this, by the way? Will anybody? Uh, I don't know, it? probably still daily. All right. All right. <laughs> well, Web, Web will watch it. You may Web will watch it, will not you? Yeah, for for the benefit of Phil, we we felt it were out of kilter a bit. We'd not got the balance right. So you know, in in, in the nicest possible way, we felt that you know there were too much. You know, you're too too erratic in games. Yeah. Uh, too erratic week to week. Too erratic in games. But but the big one for me was erratic. Um, it, in personality wise, and one yeah. way that reflected on training field, which you won't mind me saying, where we yeah. felt you got involved in too many. Running battles with people, uh, spray too many people, um, that resulted in, yeah, a fair bit of negativity around you, really. And, and I thought yeah. it was going to be something that would, um, you know, catch up with us longer term if if we didn't address it and, and catch yeah. up with you. You know, if you didn't make the necessary changes, then uh, coaching staff would get, get sick of some of this. But, but more importantly, your teammates would get sick of some of this, too. Yeah. And, and I think the really important part of it for me was well, you knew you know when, when yeah. we sat down and you know, I don't mind saying I got Kevin involved in the conversation just so um, so there was no ambiguity so, yeah. so so my message was getting across really clearly uh, that look you know there's a way forward for us from this but I've got to work on the communication with you Yeah. Uh, but I want to be really clear in the message that I'm giving to you that you know for you to progress as a player which which we really felt you could. You had to make some, you know, some pretty big adjustments to the way that maybe you addressed certain situations, spoke to people, um, 
consistency and, and I say some erratic parts of play, but we felt we could fix that up. Uh, but it were a difficult conversation for you to yeah. sit and have to hear. But I would say you did know. You know, when we sat down for that conversation, you said I sort of know when this was coming, which I thought, you know, I thought as tough as this is to have to deliver some of this. Um, the fact that you knew were great. You know, from out of that though, that that's where we were able to move forward a bit. You know, we wanted you, I guess, to be more of a team player, uh, yeah. both in terms of what we did on the field, but in terms of, not that you weren't a, a team player off the field, That that's wrong to say that, but harness, you know, harness um, your competitive spirit in the right way, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's a big payoff when, you know, we had a cultural, a cultural review last week that JP chaired for us and it was noticeable that two or three guys made a mention of uh, you know the changes that you've made which which I know you've worked really hard on and, and yeah. we're trying to work really hard with you that hey look we recognise that you've made these changes and it's really benefiting us as a team and us as a group so you know it's good it's good that we're seeing that and I think you know we're seeing that in uh, in the way that you're playing pal yeah, that that's it. My my point on it is when you look back, it, that was a difficult conversation and uh, it was hard to hear. But then I think I said within the end of the conversation and like I said the day after, I'd probably realised that I needed that and I'd probably got to that stage where I was probably getting to that, I had that much of an influence on a squad because I was actually playing and doing minutes. Yeah. And started realising that, oh, well, someone's actually investing a bit in me by saying that, oh, he's... You're doing that for 15 minutes. It was actually, no, you can't carry on. If you want to progress to where you want to get to, you have got to change this. And yeah. probably appreciated that. And, and that's what I actually needed, even though it wasn't nice to hear. And just on yeah. on that stuff that we're talking about, the running battles and, and stuff like that, I, I did sense some of that. And, and I didn't I didn't want to be that way. Um, didn't want yeah. to be that way. Didn't, didn't, want to, didn't want to have people think about me that way. Because um, at the end, it, it was just me wanting to win, really. And I think that yeah. built up through... Yeah, I was getting some good performances and some good plays out there over, and probably created a bit of an ego. Um, but also, yeah. it was a difficult situation as a group. It, it, we, were, we were awful. Everyone was down every week. Everyone frustrated. Um, yeah. And it was just, like I said, it just needed someone to, to rein you in and said, this is, you can't do this. And give you that focus, really, which which we ended up doing. And hopefully, we're on the route to, to fixing most of that up and, and progressing yeah. on it. Well, easiest thing is, you know, at time it's like, what do I do now? And easiest thing is, you know, a change your club don't don't necessarily change your problems. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, yeah. we too, right. we could see, you know, we could see the good in you, um, yeah. but you were probably at times, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, a, a difficult uh, a difficult person to play with at times for some of your teammates. Yeah. You know, yeah. in, in terms of. Uh, um, some parts of er erratic play, but some of them erratic traits off the field by, yeah. you know, getting into getting into verbal yeah. fights with people and running battles and, and all that, and a lot of them centered yeah. around. Uh, but but you knew, you know, you did yeah. you, you did now, and yeah. you know, say you worked really hard to do it, and I think you would have to say you feel in a much better and different place than than where you were last year, and it's probably more enjoyable for you to come in. Yeah. You know, knowing you all knowing that you can do your little bits, but still, yeah, be harnessed really productively. Yeah, and it's, it's given that, like, like you said, the, the the mentions that you're getting in, in the groups and stuff like that is it, it's showing me now that I've received them. It is the value in them compared to the value in going coming up with a big play on my own? It, and it's not the, the value now as us as a group is we're rewarding each other for a team collective effort, and I think that's a big difference in yeah than where we are as a group. Yeah. Uh, should we lighten the mood? Should we lighten the mood and finish up with some quick fire questions? See how you go with this. Yeah. Oh, are the rugby league? Uh, no, we're staying away for we've done enough. Done enough rugby league, mate. Done enough rugby league. Right. So you're on death's row. You've got your last pre-course meal. It could be anything. What would it be? Uh. Yeah. Quick fire these, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's tough. There's a little restaurant in Gaff that we go to all the time called Bella Vita. Yeah. We do. Uh, that would be. Yeah, saffron prawns for starters. Uh, probably a steak, mate, and strawberries. Too easy. Strawberries. Strawberries. You can take the lad out of Fev, but you can't take the Fev out of the lads. 
Um, one thing on your bucket list that you'd like to do before you die? Uh, go to the Super Bowl in New Orleans. Super Bowl. In New Orleans, right? No worries. Describe yourself in three words. Yeah. Um, hard working. I'd yeah. say around, around the, um, the rugby stuff, hard working. Uh, yeah, difficult at times. That's one That's one for everybody else around me in here. Difficult. Yeah. Um, and a contradiction. Yeah, right. No worries. Favourite place to holiday? Dubai. I'm with you on that one. Uh, you're stuck in a desert island. You can pick one of the current squad. Who would it be to go with you? You're stuck, stranded. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a hard one. Coaching staff, playing staff, or purely and simply uh, playing staff. Anyone, in, anyone in Leeds Rhinos? Anyone? Mikaletsky. Mikaletsky. Yes. yes, and if you have to eat him, there's plenty. Of, there's a good month's worth. Yeah, there. if you're on if that you film him. alive, do you ever see that film alive where that playing? No, I've not. With Uruguayan your rugby team on. No, no. Yeah, Mick would be good to be, I reckon. It's plenty to yeah. go on. Uh, celebrity, come down with me. You can pick three celebrities, past, present, dead, alive. Uh, rugby players, anything in the world, who would it be? Rugby players too? Anyone. Could be anyone in the world, because obviously you're a bit of a rugby nerd, so you want your superstars might be rugby players. Yeah, I'll have to, I might have to think about that. Let me come back to that. Give me the next yeah. one. The last one. Right. The, the next, this is the last one because we could probably talk about this because this is the best one for me. And I think we've nailed the best lookalike comment. But <laughs> best lookalike comment everyone's ever made to you. You know I enjoy these. Well, you call me. When I ref games at training, you call me Phil Bentham. If I join in <laughs> games, if I join in games, Dobson. if I play on wing or centre, you call me Keith Senior. If I play half back, you call me Michael Dobson. There's a bit of a theme in the. Well, the best one, the best one was when we had the football out and the Jack Stan was the best one of our favourites. <laughs> uh, oh, but when, with the glasses. When it was first going, I were at home and Steve Kenny called me Zidane. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think the with the glasses on, the Ariel is my new favourite, you know. <laughs> I didn't realise you had glasses on. You'll never um, see them again. What about the. Uh, do you reckon you can get a celebrity come down with me or not? Oh, God, it sounds boring. I'm too hard off the top of my head. If I kept yeah, it away from rugby, rugby. If, if I kept it away from rugby, I don't know, some some famous rock star that's got loads of good stories, somebody like that. I don't know, <laughs> Mick Jagger. Or stories. Yeah, somebody like that. Mick Jagger, yeah. David Bowie and John Lennon. There we go, there we go. That, that is us. That is us. Uh, I never thought I'd say that I'd been in Rich Agar's bedroom, but I have. And that's the first ever dog cast. Cheers, mate. It was um, it was class. Dog cast. Listen, I'll be keen to see how Phil edits this. Yeah. A little bit of swearing he needs to take out dog from you there, because I'm sure it's been yeah. after all the kids. Um, yeah. so well done. We get a bleep. We've got a new career for you, haven't we? Talking. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Hey, we, all, we always do. Cheers, pal. See you, mate.